Hey guys, does the name Pirate at 40 ring a bell? <laughs> this has been a story that's been going around for quite a while. It's interesting to see it finally get resolved here. Now, t- why don't you tell us about it, Stephanie? This is a name that I haven't heard for, oh gosh, maybe over a year. Maybe our listeners remember if they've been interested in Bitcoin for a while. There used to be an organization called Bitcoin Savings and Trust, and it was run by this person who went by the name Pirate or Pirate at 40 on the Bitcoin Talk forum. And what this person was promising was basically like you invest Bitcoins with them and you would get crazy returns. I think it was like 6% a week, something on that order. Just just nuts. Even though his name was Pirate and he was promising some kind of returns on Bitcoins that seemed relatively crazy, a lot of people gave him Bitcoins. It turned out to be a scam. He basically took the money and ran at some point. No. And he- yeah. <laughs> Say it ain't so. <laughs> and yeah, I guess what do you expect from somebody named Pirate who's promising you outrageous returns on your Bitcoins? But yeah, that's exactly what happened. And people were mad. And I even saw some discussions. I remember at the time seeing some discussions on the Bitcoin talk forum about getting together like a bounty to like find this guy and hire a hitman or something like that. Because people <laughs> were so angry at this this guy. And they said, you know, how can we actually get justice? Apparently, it's not so much outside of the legal system anymore because this person has been found and charged by the SEC, actually, which is the, you know, Securities and Exchange Commission in the in the U.S. So he's from Texas. The headline is the Securities and Exchange Commission today charged a Texas man and his company with defrauding investors in a Ponzi scheme involving Bitcoin. The SEC alleges that Trendon T. Shavers, who is the founder and operator of Bitcoin Savings and Trust, offered and sold Bitcoin denominated investments through the internet using monikers Pirate and Pirate at 40. Shavers raised at least 700,000 Bitcoins in Bitcoin savings and trust investments, which amounted to more than 4.5 million based on the average price of Bitcoin in 2011 and 2012 when the investments were offered and sold. Today, the value of 700,000 Bitcoins exceeds 60 million. So this guy would have made out like a pirate, literally, uh, if he hadn't been caught. <laughs> the SEC alleges that Shavers promise investors up to 7% weekly interest based on Bitcoin savings and trusts market arbitrage activity, which supposedly included selling to individuals who wish to buy Bitcoin, quote, off the radar in quick fashion or large quantities. In reality, it was a scam and a Ponzi scheme in which Shavers used Bitcoin from new investors to make purported interest payments and cover investor withdrawals on investments. Shavers also diverted investors' Bitcoin for day trading in his own account on a Bitcoin currency exchange and exchanged investors' Bitcoin for U.S. dollars to pay his own personal expenses. So basically, he's like Bernie Madoff of Bitcoin. Yeah, now that he's been caught, there are people who are speculating that the U.S. government or the SEC may be controlling, at this point, a a huge amount of Bitcoins. Have you guys heard anything about this? What do you think? I I think it's really good that the SEC is protecting us after the fact by ensuring that the only people who can run Ponzi schemes are either the Federal Reserve (laughs) or properly organized and licensed Ponzi scheme operators of Wall Street. (laughs) Um, Yeah, he just he just wasn't uh, friends with the right people. This pirate at 40. Yeah, I know. And the funny thing is, if only he had held Right. If only if only instead of Ponziing it up, he had held he, he would have been able to pay back that return and more to, yeah. to his investors. That's the hilarious part of this. The thing that jumps out at me about this is I'm surprised the SEC chose to get involved because it's not like, you know, you, you mentioned that he's been caught. That really actually wasn't the case. When the Ponzi looked like it was a Ponzi about a year ago, that name started floating around and the companies that he had previously been associated with kind of started coming up and, and circulating through the uh, – through the Bitcoin community in certain parts of it. So they didn't catch him. So he was already identified before this? Right. Yeah. His identity was identified. But the thing is, is that- Oh, gotcha. That's important. You take this same story and you transpose it onto like Beanie Babies, for example. What if people were investing, quote unquote, (laughs) in this, you know, in this, uh, in his scheme using Beanie Babies instead of Bitcoins? Would the SEC still be involved? Because to this point, again, we, we keep going through these cycles where it's not legitimate and then somebody does something that makes it seem like it actually is pretty legitimate because otherwise they shouldn't be paying attention to it and shouldn't have any jurisdiction over it. So that's the question right. kind of that, that keeps coming up to me is what exactly is Bitcoin in the eyes of the government? What is it in the eyes of these various regulatory bodies? Don't Beanie Babies have intrinsic value though? <laughs> <laughs> 
they exist in the real world. They're real. <laughs> I guess. But so, you're so, really hungry, you could eat them. That's, I think, the question that, that I keep coming back to, though, is, is, what is what does this all mean in terms of the long-term implications? Pirate, first off, he didn't have a company. You know, I've seen lots of stories referring to this as Bitcoin Savings and Trust, but there wasn't any formal structure for it. I mean, this was literally one guy on the internet, you know, quote unquote, selling things to other guys on the internet for something that nobody thought was money until, you know, fairly recently. So how does, th it seems like there's yeah. a disconnect here between the regulatory actions that we're getting and what the actual understood reality is. Because I mean, if this is true and the SEC does in fact have jurisdiction over non-formal investments like this in alternative currencies or alternative commodities, then that means that every single one of the Bitcoin stock exchanges out there is totally out of compliance and that they are, in the eyes of the SEC, regulated by them too. So I mean, so that's the thing that that I look at this and say, OK, well, if, if the SEC is taking this stance, that has really wide ranging repercussions, not just on people who, who have scams like like Trendon did, but on all these alternative ownership mechanisms that are they're used to raise funds for mining ventures, for new technologies and for things that just, you know, where people are wanting to try out this new funding mechanism. Those things suddenly are regulated and none of those exchanges are complying at all. And I wonder if there were some people who got taken or got duped with Bitcoin savings and trust who complained to them and oh, said, oh, yes. look, you got to do something. That, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, exactly. No, we heard lots of people talking about that. But the thought was always that, OK, right, go complain. But again, you know, try it with Beanie Babies. I bet you the SEC laughs you out of the room and, or doesn't return your calls. Absolutely. And it's in another way, it's a good thing, because essentially here we don't have the SEC coming in and telling you a priori what regulations you should follow Um but essentially what they're doing here is uh, good old pure enforcement. I don't think there's any question that this was a Ponzi scheme. I don't think there's any question that investors were defrauded. If the SEC is able to go in here and somehow do a somewhat structured unwinding of this, see if any money can be recovered, return some of that money to the original investors and apply the law, well, you know, that's, that's not a bad thing. Some people apparently did make money out of this. 500,000 bitcoins in investor withdrawals and purported interest payments? People who are in it early made money of it. I mean, that's the thing about a Ponzi scheme is right. that if you get it's in really early, exactly, <laughs> that, that it's a pretty good deal for you. It's good work if you can find it. I think the comparison to Madoff, though, is really, really unfair. We're talking about one thousandth of the amount supposedly stolen by Madoff, stolen by Pirate of 40. So no matter what we do in Bitcoin in terms of fraud, we rank amateurs by comparison to the world or global financial system and the staggering amounts of fraud that are happening there. Yeah, that's a good point. I wonder when the next bigger Bitcoin scam will be or if there will be a bigger one. And if there's not, maybe that says something about the legacy banking system and the, the stock market and maybe there is actually less potential for fraud because of all these community enforcement mechanisms and because of uh, people being wiser consumers and, and just the nature of Bitcoin itself in the Bitcoin community. I think the nature of it really is, is a key point. The, the fact that it's non-reversible imposes a certain discipline on the buyer to be more careful about when they send their money because they know they have no recourse. There's no daddy state to come in and help you get your money back at least not in most cases. I think that implicit understanding changes people's behavior in a way that's positive for Bitcoin. Andreas, I wanted to ask you about this. One of the other things that the SEC did, in addition to releasing this, you know, about the Ponzi, um, is they issued a investor warning and an investor alert to people who might potentially want to get involved with Bitcoin, various uh, denominated assets, and basically saying that there is a predilection right now for scams in this particular area. I was wondering what you thought of that. Is that a standard thing for the SEC to do? <laughs> oh, dear. I, that's so funny. That's, this, this is, uh, sorry, we're, we're at Dow 15,000. Uh, the banks are st stealing a uh, trillion dollars a year. And the SEC is warning that Bitcoin has predilections to fraud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you put it in perspective like that. Yeah, I guess. I mean, listen, standard warnings like this towards investors are, are a bit like the State Department warning people not to visit Egypt or, <laughs> you know, warning people not to visit Greece or things like that. Quite honestly, it's just like those warnings. Sure, Greece is dangerous, but have you have you been to Chicago after dark? Right. 
Uh, the other thing it mentioned specifically in that alert was this idea of accredited investors, right? So that's something that I've been I've been you know talking to a few people about, specifically people who have invested in these Bitcoin stock exchanges. And their point is, is that if those minimum, if those accredited investor requirements were there, then they wouldn't be able, they wouldn't be allowed to make that type of investment that they've made through these quasi stock exchanges that have popped up in the Bitcoin space. Do you think that there is any validity to this idea of accredited investors versus people of lower net worths who aren't allowed to participate in the system? I don't know. I'm kind of torn on this one. It's both a simultaneously a good idea in that if you don't really have the money to invest, you shouldn't be invested in, in the most risky things. But at the same time, it's absolutely patronizing, paternalistic. And of course, it's, it's, it's also completely arbitrary. So, you know, if you have $500,000 or more, that means you have more sense than someone who has less than $500,000. Quite honestly, I've known shrewd investors who have less money, and I've known trustafarians who have a lot more and not a brain cell in their head. So <laughs> I don't think really that distinction really means anything. And I would be reluctant to start adding kind of irrelevant distinctions and these kind of paternalistic controls to the Bitcoin space to simulate what really has failed to protect people from fraud in the straight economy. Because here's the thing, as soon as you've run out of accredited investors to fleece, you start fleecing homeowners who don't need to be qualified, and then you steal from their mortgages. So the homeowners weren't accredited investors, and they managed to buy into some tremendously risky assets in the form of these mortgages. So essentially, this isn't really working, at least not if the idea is to protect consumers from excess risk. I think the other thing, of course, to take away from this, and I, you know, we'll just end this topic on this note, I think, is Bitcoin, whether it's regulated or unregulated, is still a really risky space to operate in. And so any time that you see something that has the appearance of being too good to be true, then it probably is. <laughs> you know, and that that may not always be true. There may be exceptions, but you really, really need to do your homework. Obvious scam is obvious, right? So, you know, Ponzi's look like Ponzi's because they're Ponzi's. The point is, is that we need to be very, very skeptical as participants in the new digital economy when looking at any of these things, because a lot of the systems that are there to protect us simply aren't there. Now, whether or not those systems work in real life to protect us is a completely different matter. But the fact that they're simply not present here is, I think, very important to keep in mind moving forward. I'm not sure really that the presence or not makes such a big difference. Honestly, I think it's important to look at the difference between perceived risk and actual risk. You look at Bitcoin, it has very high perceived risk. No one is walking into Bitcoin thinking Bitcoin is a safe investment. I don't think anybody tells you that Bitcoin is a safe investment. I think it's fairly obvious to all. From the get-go, the Bitcoin is a risky investment. Now, that's fine because there the appearance matches the reality. What I would be more concerned about is when you walk into a, a seemingly rock-solid safe investment, like a mortgage or a student loan, and then realize that that investment has the same risk as an over-leveraged derivative. That's a problem. And so I don't think we need more regulation to make obviously risky investments be obviously risky. I think, if anything, what we've seen is a failure of regulation to protect people when they're obviously safe investments in things like student loans and mortgages and depositor accounts are being assailed by these predatory banks in a way that doesn't reveal the underlying risk. So yeah, Bitcoin's risky, but everybody knows that. We don't need to regulate it more just so that people know it's risky. I'd be more worried about the things that are risky, but nobody's talking about. If I showed you a website where you could easily purchase electronics from the world's largest distributor with Bitcoins at 0% markup, would you think it was too good to be true? Good news. It's real. And it's at BitcoinStore.com. Choose from half a million items, save money over Amazon and Newegg, and convert your Bitcoins to real world items. You can even buy with privacy. All they need is a shipping address. But don't take my word for it. See for yourself at BitcoinStore.com.